you for that um, introduction. Um, I'm used to being in all buildings. Um, Turk School of Business was founded in 1900. That's the first MBA program in the world. Harvard came four years later in 1904. Uh, and I, I realized we're in a church. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to give you a religious experience in this paper. It's, I'm going to try my best. Um, when, when I chose the topic to talk about, I'm, some of you know I grew up in, in Oslo, Norway. Uh, so uh, this paper is actually about Norway. Um, my co-author, uh, Knut Nygård, he is a Norwegian PhD student of Karin Torberg. Um, and Karin grew up in Sweden, so we also are Scandinavians here. Um, and then we have a certain feeling for what we're talking about in this paper, I think. So uh, the topic is, is also very European, so that's why I thought it might be a proper thing to, to talk about at, at this conference. Um, these gender quotas is something that Europe has initiated and, and continued with. Um, the first one came from Norway in, 2000, in 2003. Um, so what the paper wants to do is, is not talk about gender politics. Um, you may be for or against it. But the, the issue here is really can we use this gender quota as, a, as an experiment in terms of finding out what are the cost benefits, what is, what is the net present value in a sense, or the cost benefits of a gender quota. And what a, what a gender quota do in our, in our mind is to shape the board in terms of two things. One is the uh, experience of the board. You, you are forcing a number of females into the board with less CEO experience, for sure, uh, also less uh, board experience per se. Um, now these females I'm going to talk about are all highly professional, highly educated. Um, they're younger than the typical males. Um, someone wrote a paper on the UK, I think, where they say that the, uh, the, the best predictor of becoming a director was whether you were a member of a golf club uh, rather than um, education. So these women came in um, increase the level of education, I think, in, in the boards. Uh, the other thing it does, perhaps, is to increase board independence. Um, and almost by definition, these females were not part of the old boys network. Um, and the question is, did they then, in a sense, were they anticipated by the market, to, uh, by investors, to actually be more independent? And is it independence good or bad for, for, for the firm? Um, when I came to this, um, I'm a little critical of board research per se because we haven't found very much. Um, these experiments we have out there, these, these, these studies, suffer quite a bit, as you all know, from uh, you know endogeneity, and, and, and it's hard to interpret these coefficients. So we, if you ask a question, um, does board matter for firm value, which is a very basic question in corporate finance, I'm not so sure we know the answer. And if you look at Renee Adams and, and her work, uh, and Weisbeck, and, the survey that they did, recently did, uh, they don't think so either that uh, there's a clear connection between um, board composition and, and firm performance. So in a sense, this experiment that we're going to talk about here is quite unique. It, it shakes up the board, it gives us a, uh, course, a natural course experiment uh, to, again, as I said, uh, shake up uh, the experience of the board. The experience, in a sense, goes down which might be negative, right? Um, and the independence probably goes up. Uh, the degree of uh, education, youth, etc., goes up. So the net effect of all this stuff uh, is what we're going to try and, and put some numbers on. Um, it also belongs to the story here that there, there is one very important paper already out there on this same quota. There's actually three of them. I'm, I'm going to talk about all three of them, but the particularly this one by Ahern and Dittmar in QGAE 2012, who came out with a statement with estimations that the effect of this quota uh, that I'm going to talk about here is what well, was highly negative, large and negative. Um, now that would be fine uh, in per se, if, 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 if the estimates are correct, um, it would actually show you that there is a connection between board composition and, and firm performance. Uh, the problem was, in, in the eyes of these co-authors here and me, that the, the, the magnitude that came out in the QGA paper was just very large. Larger than you might think. Um, 
I'm summarizing the paper a little bit here because I'm not sure if I'm going to get through all of it later on. But, but the, the AD, the Ahern Bitmar results uh, showed you that there would be about a 20% decline in the market value of listed firms on the Austin Stock Exchange if you had zero females going in um, before the quota. That's a large number. It's kind of a number that we in corporate finance associate with the financial distress or, or product recalls, that kind of stuff. So, in our mind, we, we, we couldn't quite understand that that number was, was a good estimate. So we went back, and this is what I'm going to talk about, what happened after we went back. Um, so, let me just show, this is, I'm going to promise you not to show you the graph like this again, because you probably can't see it. Um, but the, today, the average um, percent females in, in the largest EU listed firms is 23%, up from about 14, five years ago. Uh, and in the U.S. It's, it's 18 percent. So there has been a steady increase, actually, in female representation on boards over the last 10 years. Um, in, in this graph, particular graph, there's eight yellow or brown bars that are firms in Europe, that are countries in Europe, with quotas. Um, Germany was the last one to do this in, in 2013. Um, Netherlands and, 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 and Bel Netherlands and Spain have quotas, but they don't have any um, penalties for not complying with it. So those so the quotas vary a bit across countries. They, are, they tend to lie between 30 and 40 percent females. The you Norwegian know, quota is is 40 percent of each sex. So in a sense, uh, it's as much as you can get um, with the quota. Okay, so I talked a little bit about, um, you know, what could be the valuation effect. How do you think about the valuation effect? Um, and as I said, independence, um, I always felt independence was, is good for the board, but there, there's discussions about that too, not everybody agrees on that. But in my mind, independence, increased independence is probably good, uh, while reduced experience probably bad. So the net effect is an empirical issue here. And as I said, Ahern and Dittmar came up with this estimate of minus 20% um, uh, in terms of a panel estimation on total skew that I'm going to come back to. Uh, of course, you also have this notion that the boards are irrelevant per se. That's also consistent. I mean, you can't reject that either on, on the basis of the, of the current literature. These, are, these may be neutral mutations in the cross section after the shock to these boards. So it is a matter of, of estimating this, this uh, validation effect. So Ahern and Dittmar came up with a, a very good analysis. Uh, the paper is an excellent paper. I, I urge you to read it in the QGA 2012. It's a long paper and they have lots of uh, descriptive uh, material around these females that came into the board. So the only issue we're going to make with the paper is actually uh, the estimation of the valuation effect itself. Um, but you know, the, they, they established that there is a decrease in, um, in experience with these women. CEO experience, and we find the same thing. Um, they establish that there is an increase in education, and by, surprisingly, perhaps, at least that these females, other than CEO experience, they have as much experience as the men. Um, they're professionals, they're the vice presidents' experience, they are professionals, lawyers. So, so they come in, they don't housewives per se, I mean, they're, they're, they're out there working. So the question really is. Uh, with enough of them, in a sense, when you impose a law like this, you, uh, are there enough female professionals to hire to this board so that you don't um, um, have to go down too much down on the supply curve of, of, of skill sets? So that's going to be part of the, uh, the analysis here. Now, the wall, at the time when AD came out with their paper, um, it was published in 2012, but in 2011 the working paper was circulated and all the major newspapers picked it up, financial papers, Wall Street Journal, Economist, Financial Times. And on, on this long paper, what they did focus on is exactly what we're focusing on, namely the negative evaluation effect that uh, came out of the paper. So, clearly that's the part of the paper that I think is most important for, for, for the governance um, research that we're doing. So that's what we're going, going after. Now, why do we challenge AD? Um, well, 
as I said before, if they are right, if, they, if, if we would confirm the results uh, the best we can, it, it does mean, because this shock is really exogenous, it's really performance, it would mean that there is a significant uh, correlation between, or causality between, changing board composition and firm performance. So, so it is really important to, to me, this experiment is actually more powerful even than the US SOX in 2002. Uh, for two reasons. One is that SOX, the Simon Sox Act in, in, in the United States, who also had governance implications, had internal control implications as well. So the, it was a much broader sweep of governance changes, which makes it a little harder to um, conclude from, say, event studies or, or, or evaluation effects to SOX, whether it's actually the, the board independence or something else that, that dri primarily drives those results. Here, it's just changing gender, right? So, you know, it's just changing independence and uh, experience. The other thing about SOX was that it was, of course, driven by Enron, the crisis that came before. Um, so, in a sense, the SOX itself is part endogenous. It's, 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 it will, it, it uh, addresses an, a performance problem, in a sense. Where, well, this law, um, it's just gender politics, which has nothing to do with, uh, with performance per se. So, in that sense, this is a very powerful experiment. So, what is our key finding before I go on? Well, we cannot reject the hypothesis that there was zero valuation impact of the law. And that's quite dramatically different from the bit marks. So I'm going to explain in detail why that's the case. I can tell you right now, there's nothing wrong with the, with the AM bit mark data. We're not complaining about any sample differences or differences in turn or, or data mining, mean, nothing like that. It's going to be a purely econometric uh, correction of what they did. Um, we also can look at some other things, uh, like you know, if, if you are a firm and you back in 2002 or 2003 in Norway you were you were told there was going to be a quota, what would you do? Right? If you thought it was going to be expensive for you. Again, referring back to what AD says, what would you do to, to minimize the cost? Right? And clearly, one thing you could do was to increase board size. A typical board size in Norway at the time was five, the average board size is five. Um, and the quota with five means you have to have two females. So you would have to let go two males, uh, to give room for two females, or if you want to keep all males, you expand the board size. Because you could expand it to eight, actually. With eight, uh, you could have three more women and keep all your five males. So we, we think that the, the cost of expanding the board size from five to eight puts an upper limit on the possible cost of the law itself. Um, and if you think about that statement, then go back to the minus 20%, the 20% decline, there, there's no, um, I don't think personally that we can argue that going from uh, five to eight board members um, in a typical board is going to decline, it's going to cost you 20% of firm value. So there's something there already, I think, in terms of these firms not changing the board size that indicates that the cost is lower than going to eight members. And we're also going to look at some other things. Uh, Matza Miller has a very good paper in 2013 in the American Economic Review where they look at earnings uh, or return on assets, um, you know, cash flow equations uh, to see if over time the performance of these firms changed after the quota. We're going to go back to that. And the, the final thing we're going to look at in this paper is whether firms changed their incorporation from those firms that were legally by, bound by the law or whether they switched to uh, limited partners actually, limited the public, limited private partnerships forms that uh, are not subject to the law. And it turns out that the difference with those two legal forms, the only difference really, uh, is that you have to be a, a public, you know, P PLC, public limited partner, a limited firm, to be traded on the on the uh, stock exchange and to sell equity to the public. From the financing, from debt financing perspective, from corporate governance perspective, there's really not much difference between those two legal forms. So the question was. The firms, in response, because they felt the law would be costly for them, uh, switched back to, um, to 
these other legal forms. We're going to have a look at that too. Now, I have two quotes uh, because uh, what I'm going to be doing in this paper is actually criticizing another paper in a sense. Right? So, uh, and then, so I wanted two quotes that, that tells me a little, little bit of, you know, are we doing enough of this in finance? And then if you ask Ivo Welf, who started the Critical Finance Review, you know, he thinks it's way too little of this, um, you know, you know re replicating, going after, and, and, and checking evidence in other papers. Um, and I found this quote in the, in the, this, the, the last issue of the American Economic Review. The whole issue is about replication. And the idea there's too little of it, um, and, and maybe the reason why there's too little of it is exactly what it says here. You know, replications can generate feelings of abuse, bullying, and persecution in both replicator and replicatees. So um, there's a reason why there's not that much of it. Um, I have to say at the same time that David Dittmar have been very you know, graceful about this, and they gave us their data. So, uh, uh, but in general, I think probably we need more of these replicating exercises. Okay, so, so ASA, ASA is, is the legal form that are subject to the quota. And ASA has firms have two types. Some of them are listed, or half of them are listed, the other half is not listed. But you have to be an ASA to become listed. So we think this non-listed status, ASA status, has to do with firms um, planning to raise equity and to in the public, and go public and then raise equity. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a temporary status. Uh, what we're going to show you is that none of these AS, publicly listed ASAs are converted to another status. They stayed, they remained publicly traded firms. So they didn't think it was worth it to, to, to delist from the stock exchange. Uh, a number of the non-listed ASAs did convert to what we call AS here, uh, which is the other set of firms. Um, there's about 100,000 AS and about 500 ASAs in, in the economy up there. Um, so, of the, un, of the unlisted ASAs, um, which have a minimal cost of uh, flipping to the AS status, a fair number did, um, but we don't know why they did it, because they, they will never tell us why they did, why we changed the incorporation status. And they've done it since 1998 until the whole sample period, until 2014. So we, we see, uh, we see non-listed ASAs uh, converting to AS over time. Probably many of them did not, although they abandoned their plans to say raise equity, for example, and go back to the AS status. Uh, but they don't tell you why. But there was, in, in 2005 and 2006, which is the period when this law uh, had to be complied with, there was an increase in, uh, in uh, a little increase in the conversion of those firms. So, uh, at the margin, you might say maybe those firms thought it was a little costly. So here's the uh, here's the quota itself. Um, the only reason I'm putting this up is because uh, it's not just 40 percent all the time. It depends on the size of the board. We clearly you have to have uh, a whole number in order to put the female in. So. Um, it varies between 30 and 40 percent. For so, what we're going to do in this paper, we're going to actually take the actual uh, short shortfall of a female for each firm. So, we need to get to 40 percent. Um, so, we, we're going to take the difference between the number of female you had before the law and 40 percent, and call that the shortfall. So, the maximum shortfall then is of course 40 percent, right? So. Um, uh, and then for each firm, we can also you know, dummy out the ones with the maximum shortfall and see if those firms uh, behave differently than, say, a firm that had maybe already one or even two females in, at, uh, on the board. So we're going to try and do a little bit of different diff in, in that sense, and then we also do a diff towards AS firms, which uh, don't need to comply with the law at all. So this is the average board size uh, over time in the sample period from uh, to the two, until 2014, actually. And you see the blue line is the, the increase in board, in, in, in female participation in the board. And the two bars tells you the period when you started to have to comply and when you, when you ended compliance uh, in 2007. So in December 2005, this law became finally active. And the firms had two years to comply. And if you didn't, 
uh, the penalty was forced liquidation. So everybody complied. Um, so, but it's interesting that you see the average board size is stuck at five. So, so, so that didn't change at all. Uh, firms didn't really uh, care enough to change average board size. I have a slide on the frequency distribution of uh, the number of board members. It's centered around five and some, a small group of firms, just a few percentage of the firms, went from four to five, they went up to five. Because both with four and five members, you, you need two females. So in a sense, they could, uh, they could keep one male then uh, by going up to five. And a few set of firms also went from six to five. Uh, because with six, you would jump the uh, number of females. So there's a little bit of movement by the firms themselves that might be taken as those firms uh, thinking the cost was enough to switch. Uh, but on average, in the, in the data, uh, nothing like that happens really. Um, the other thing is, that's interesting to ask is, you know, with enough, uh, what, what was the supply of qualified female directors? Um, if the supply is short, uh, then you would expect uh, several females to accumulate several boards, right? So, uh, you would get, in the old days we call these males golden shirts, now we could develop the golden skirts, perhaps. Uh, the, but that did not happen, if you look at these graphs. Um, that surprised me a little bit. The, the average number of, well, 80, 80 plus percent of the males, both before and after the law, have, have, have one board seat in Norway. These are listed firms. And 80% and of the females, both for, before and after, uh, have one board seat. So, we're talking about a, a large cross-section of females that came in, that was elected into these boards, and this is it's a handful of females that, that accumulated more than two board seats in, the, in this distribution. So again, uh, maybe people thought the supply was good enough, and that also feeds back into an expectation about what the valuation effect is. Right? So um, if there's enough supply, uh, you, you lower your expectation about this being a negative event. So, um, the whole debate started in February 2002, and that's the event that uh, Ahon Wittmann uses in their paper. Um, and then that's the most interesting event we're going to use as well. So in February 2002, it became clear that the, that the current government would do this. Um, and the event study will center in particular on that, on that date. Um, now, there are other dates afterwards. It took until 2005 before the law essentially had nailed down also the penalty and then finally enacted by, by Parliament. Uh, there are some events, we're going to follow all of these events and check them out just in case, but it is a February 22 event that's most interesting to, uh, to uh, all of us. And, and that's where Ayanna Wittmar find a significant negative abnormal return in a five-day window around 20. February 22, uh, three and a half percent. I think that's, that is, well, let, let me do my analysis first and we get back to, to uh, A.R. Dittmar. This is, this is a, an event study of all of these, uh, all of these five events. There's a six of them, two, uh, five events. Um, and what we're doing, we're essentially doing the only way you can do an event study for an event that affects all firms at the same time, right? This is a law that affects everybody in the exactly at the same time. So you form a portfolio of all the firms, right, and then you, you pick out the abnormal return on the event day. Now by forming a portfolio of all the listed firms here in calendar time, uh, you make sure that the cross-sectional dependence between these firms is, is accounted for in the standard error on the abnormal return. Right. So that's what we're doing, and that yields this table which uh, has absolutely no abnormal returns in any of the uh, cells anyway. Um, and it doesn't matter here whether you're using a sub-portfolio of, of the highest shortfall firms, for example, those with zero females, okay, they had to hire two of them, uh, or whether you use a, a full Fama Frames momentum model or just a single mar you know, uh, market model. So this is solid. We, we tried all kinds of things. You, you cannot find evidence of significant abnormal return. And of course, 
you're not going to get anything in the cross section either. So when you regress each firm's abnormal return on whatever variable you want to put in there, you're not going to find any effect there either. So, so our event study just tells you that there's nothing going on that you can hang your hat on. There's, there's even a small sample of 15 foreign firms in listed on the, on the stock exchange, mostly in the oil industry, and they are not required to, uh, to have a course to have a quota. It's a Norwegian law, so these firms do not, they accept. And if you try and benchmark, in a, it's sort of a different diff uh, between the, the Norwegian and the foreign firm, you also don't find any significant uh, normal return. Okay, so then you go to A.R. Dittmar's paper in 2012, and what they find is minus 3.54% at no return to the subsample of firms with zero females at the time. So, um, so again, uh, our evidence says zero, and they say minus 3.5% significant. So what's the difference coming from? And what we did, what we replicated their study, and A.R. Dittmar gave us the data. So we know the firms, and we did exactly their procedure, and you replicate exactly their findings with their methodology. But there's one flaw in the methodology, and that is that they did not control for cross-sectional dependence. So the t-statistics, the, the standard error in t-statistics assumes independence in the cross-section of all these firms. Uh, in their case, it's 98 firms, or 60, 68 in the subsample of uh, zero female firms. So, they, so when this news hit these 68 firms, they take the average of all return, and they use a t-statistic that assumes statistical independence. And of course, uh, that's going to cause a bias. This is formally the bias that you create. And the bias depends on the cross section correlation between these firms in the normal times. So when we do a, a portfolio analysis, a time series portfolio of these firms, that portfolio uh, bakes in automatically the cross-sectional dependence, so our standard errors are corrected for that. And when you do that, um, you get nothing. So, I'm going to skip uh, some more details about the event study, but that's basically the story. So, the next thing you're going to so, so the event study doesn't give you anything. Um, the next thing you're going to do is look at long, long run returns. People like to look at long run returns. I don't like to look at the long run returns, but we're doing it anyway. Um, <laughs> Alex knows what I'm talking about. So, but this is a teaser that Karen likes to put up. It's a, it's a silly graph. It, it's, it's a, you know, if you sort, the, this is actually Credit Suisse department that, that has done this. They take the MSCI and uh, the, the blue line is world, the world MSCI, the index, the world index uh, with zero, with zero females on the board. And the, uh, the uh, I think the, I can't see here, but the, I think the red line is the one with at least one female on the board. Um, the point that she wants to make with this graph is that hmm, maybe having females can be positive. Uh, of course, the way to do it then is to go with a, a uh, typical alpha estimation if you want to do this. Uh, so now we go long short. So we, we go long in portfolios of uh, firms that had uh, more than higher than median females already. So, so their, their valuation consequence will probably be low and we short the ones that have zero females in order to maximize the spread uh, if there's costs in there. And you might say that this kind of regression, the alphas are zero everywhere, so you don't, you don't get anything. Uh, but the idea might be that uh, when you hire these females in the beginning, you don't quite know the, the quality that you are getting onto the board, so there might be some uncertainty resolution over time. Uh, of course, with market efficiency, that should be anticipated and baked into the uh, portfolio right away. But, you know, I'm willing to play the game that maybe the market discovers something they didn't know, and then, then maybe the alphas could actually rise up and exist in some sense. But then, there's no alphas here. Um, so, in that sense, uh, there is no in the return series either. Um, then we get to the Tobin's Q analysis, which is probably the most uh, striking analysis of, of AMD. So now we're going to ask the question, um, did implementing the, the law uh, affect Tobin's Q over time? So now we have a panel estimation, 
Um, and we're going to ask whether the zero female, this high shortfall firms, uh, had the worst development of their total SKUs over time. Again, the, the argument must be the same as, as I said before. You, because market values in corporate expected future performance, for a total SKU analysis to make any sense, you have to play the game that there's some uncertainty, some resolution that the market might not have picked up. So, be that as it may, um, we want to do this analysis that, that they do in order to see if indeed um, the, zero, uh, the zero firms, uh, the high shortfall firms, zero female firms, um, lost up to 20% in the market. Okay, so what we're doing now is essentially replicating their methodology. And it's a clever uh, IV test that they did. It's, it's interesting. So if you think about in, in 2002, right, there was a February 2002, there was a clear event that's, that increased the probability of a, a law. And then firms started, actually, they started right away to, you know, to adjust to this expected legal requirement coming up. So from 2002, until 2000, the beginning of 2008, there's a period where firms are steadily increasing their number of females up to the law. And there's some ingenuity here. Firms, to some extent, some firms waited, right, and some firms did it quickly. So, so in in the panel where you have Toby's Q and you have the percent female on the board, there's some ingenuity here. And the IV test is trying to take that out. And it takes it out in two steps, right? The first step is by essentially creating a trend. So if you started with zero females in 2002, then what was the market trend in terms of increasing females thereafter? And you create that trend by essentially year dummies. Um, and that's the first step that I showed here. Um, look at the first column. Um, so you, 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 you take the, the firm's female percentage in 2001, year end, and you multiply the year done is estimated in the panel, so you get the whole economy in terms of the trend. And these trend lines are then stuck into the second step of the IV test, so and then you ask whether the Tobin skew is affected by that trend line. So you take away the endogenous self-selection inside that, uh, that sample. So, so I'm, I'm going to do something people never do. I'm going to show you exactly what that instrument looks like. Uh, these are the trend lines that you see. So for example, on top you have a 40%. That means this is a shortfall on, on the vertical axis. So the top line is a firm that had zero females in 2001. And then the trend line is driven by this dummy, year dummies that you have estimated in step one. Okay, and there are, there are firms with different fractions starting up in 2001. So you have, this is the total set of firms that line up with these, these lines. Now, so it's, it's critical, right, to use, not to use 2002 as the base year for an exogenous distribution of female board representation. And you need to get away from 2002 because in 2002 they started in February to talk about it. And we show in the data that some firms actually started below that. But A and they used 2002. And when you do that, you get this picture. Now look at the spread, how the spread goes up. So they get significance out of the spread increase. Um, and essentially, the bottom line there is, below, is, is just around zero. Because some firms actually in 2002 completely complied with the law. Um, so what we're saying is that this picture is contaminated by endogeneity, while this picture is not. And the empirical result is that when you use our instruments, 2001 as base, you get zero significance anywhere on this analysis. When you use this one, you do get significance. And you get the same estimate. But 19% as they did work it. So uh, I guess we're 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 not going, we're not quarreling about the data or anything like that. But there, there's an econometric issue here that's real, and I think we try to explain as well as we can why um, 
you go wrong by picking 2002 as the, uh, as the baseline, base here for the instrumentation. Okay, so finally we are also using Matza Miller's, uh, uh, you know, uh, cash flow analysis. And again, there is a correction to be made. Well, not the correction, Matza Miller's, here we are really talking about a sample size issue. So they ran a regression like this, and you probably can't see this, um, but essentially ran the ROA on the left hand side, and they had the dummy for post versus pre uh, law. So at their post um, dummy is in 2006, and their sample was in 2009. So in a sense, I'm asking the question, is the ROA of these uh, Norwegian firms going up or down, or is it changing from 2006 to three years from 7, 8, 9, as, as opposed to before the law? And they find a dip in the ROA. Okay, so um, here what we're doing is, okay, so you guys went to 2009. We know there was a, a big event in 2009, so we're a little worried about that event uh, interfering with the estimation. So, in fact, if you had just 2010, uh, the significance of the estimate goes away. Um, and if you go to 2014, as we do here, um, there's also nothing. So, so what we do here is essentially saying there may be a data problem in terms of, in terms of the sample size in the months and Miller. It is interesting though that this paper came after a Dittmar and, and I, I seem to detect a certain influence of the first negative conclusion on the way subsequent papers have been concluding in their data. Um, so we're correcting that too, I suppose. Um, Again, it's not a criticism of their methodology that they did what they did, uh, but they should probably have thought about this 2009 event. Um, did firms convert? This is the last thing we're doing in the paper. Uh, did firms convert? And I, I told you the sto story already. Um, essentially, zero of the publicly traded firms on the Ulster Stock Exchange, none of them converted. So none of them felt it was important enough uh, to convert. Um, the Economist got an article actually at the time in 2014 saying a massive amount of firms delisted from the Ulster Stock Exchange. Um, so they, they didn't get it right. Um, what happened was that there were some um, non listed firms that changed their status. Um, so, but the interesting thing, since, since they don't say why they do it, we have to infer it's indirect evidence. Right? So, what we have to do is correlate the probability of switching legal status with the female shortfall. And when you do that, which we do in the paper, you do not find the correlation. Uh, so there's nothing that tells us that these conversions which happen all the time, a little bit more in 06 or 07, as you can see in this picture, um, but it's not correlated with, with um, the, the female um, shortfall. So we can't tell if, if it's driven by the quota. I think, I think basically uh, that sums it up. We also have some interesting stuff on, on, on female director turnover. Uh, it sort of struck me that if you hire females and they don't work out more than expected, uh, turnover should go up and there is no turnover effect either in the data. So, so our paper is a little... Um, I mean, it depends on how, where you're coming from, whether you like this paper or not. We have certainly corrected a lot of stuff, and if you think the topic is important, uh, then this paper is, is, is fine. Uh, if, you, if you don't think, if you didn't think in the first place that this was going to affect anything, then I'm just confirming your priors, and in that case, it might not be so exciting. Um, so, but I think uh, what we are emphasizing is that there has been a lot of attention to the prior studies, and they have done there's some significant negative effects. It, will, it would have far-reaching implications if those estimates were correct. And I guess you're saying they're not correct. Let me do it right. So, I guess we should open for questions at this point.